necessarily using them, but I've been making them. <laughs> so uh, I've got hooks, sinkers, fur, feathers, everything you can think of is all over my desk. So I get it. <laughs> yeah, I started fly fishing a couple of years ago. And oh, yeah. Was using barbless flies. Uh huh. And there's a absolute world renowned trophy trout river, probably an hour from my house. Okay. And so I was out there fishing and I was trying just to let it drift downstream and learning what I was doing. Uh huh. And I thought I got it snagged. So I start walking downstream to get my snag unhooked. And I had this giant trout and the thing jumped, spit the hook at, back at me and off it went. <laughs> So in an instant like that, are you really sad or are you like really excited? Like, oh my gosh, that was awesome. Oh, that was good. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> I know for me, I, I had that happen earlier this year. I had a, a couple of really big fish on and they broke my line and I was in my kayak just kind of floating in this lake. And I, I looked around and I wasn't really mad. I wasn't disappointed. It was like, oh, that's something that happened. <laughs> it's yeah. ambivalent. So, have you grown up in Oregon your whole life? No, um, I was born in Connecticut, raised in Southern California, um, lived all across the country in my adult life, ended up back in Southern California because uh, my mom was getting elderly and none of my siblings lived there anymore. Mm -hmm. And then in San Diego, met a guy from Klamath, so we would come up here on vacation. Okay. And every time we had to turn around and drive back through that traffic in LA and San Diego, I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and so we came up here one year for vacation and I said, let's not go back. And he said, what do you mean? We can't do that. I said, sure we can. He says, what are we going to do to make a living? I said, I don't know. We'll figure it out. So we wow. did. <laughs> I say, wow. That's kind of how me and my wife uh, moved to Colorado. Uh, we left Ohio last year. And, uh, you know, when we moved out here, we didn't have jobs. We didn't know anybody. We just kind of sold our house on a whim and just moved just like that. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been sorry. Where in Colorado are you? Uh, in Northern Colorado, Loveland. Oh yeah. My ex brother-in-law was a cop in Loveland and I used to be a detention deputy in Golden. Oh boy. <laughs> Told uh, you I moved all across the country. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we need to talk about your background and history just a little bit. It, that's uh, way too long. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly, we'll, we'll focus on the outdoor stuff. So growing up, did you get out and hike and fish and, and do all those nature things? Yes and no. Um, when I was young, we lived in Connecticut on, as I recall, it was 13 acres, which to a kid was an immense piece of property. And it had a stream. And so um, my brother, who is 12 years older than I am, was very outdoorsy. And he would go catch snakes and bring them home and keep them for a day or two to study them and then turn them loose again. Uh -huh. So that was kind of my role model for that kind of stuff. Um, my dad fished. We didn't hunt, but we fished, went out in the woods, played with creeks, played with critters, caught stuff, caught frogs. Um, Typical oh, kid stuff. Food. I should have had it ready for you. My <laughs> mom saved and she just passed away a few years ago and I found it in her saved stuff. She has a sign I made when I was probably six and I caught a bunch of toads uh -huh. and I thought I could make money. So I made this sign that says toads for sale, five cents a piece. Uh -huh. well, being six, I spelt it S-A-I-L. <laughs> That's fun. Okay, so even at a young age like that, obviously now what you do now, we'll go ahead and kind of jump to that real briefly, you know, with the Badger Run Wildlife Rehab. Have you always kind of cared for animals' well-being growing up? Yeah, yeah. Um, we always had dogs and cats and gerbils and whatnot as kids. And then I think what probably really cemented it, um, we moved to Southern California, to La Jolla, when I was – nine, I think. And we lived at the top of a two mile hill. So riding my bike down the hill to school was no big deal. Riding my bike up the hill on a hot summer day was not so much fun. <laughs> so I would go down to town and hang out and wait until my mom got off of work and then let her give me a ride home. Well, I've never been a beach person as much as I have mountains and lakes and streams. 
So all my friends were going to the beach and going surfing and body surfing and whatnot. And I'd go hang out in the local pet shop. And after a couple of weeks um, into middle school, when I was hanging out at this pet shop, the owner, who was a sweet little old lady, came up to me and she said, are you going to be here every day? And I said, I'm really sorry, ma'am. Is that a problem? She said, no, but if you're going to be here every day, put on an apron and get to work. I said, hey. okay. So um, I worked there off and on for over 20 years, all through college, went away, came back. Um, and that's where I really learned to, I mean, I was a dog and cat person before that. Mm -hmm. But this shop specialized in birds and exotic fish. So that sort of broadened my horizons. And well, I learned to train parrots. Mm -hmm. um, we were actually lucky enough to work with one of the head par parrot trainers at the San Diego Zoo. And so um, that got me really hooked on avians. Uh -huh. And then somebody brought in a mockingbird. And if you're not from the South, you don't know what a mockingbird is, but it's basically a robin. Mm -hmm. um, and they brought in a mockingbird with a broken wing. And I said, I sell parrots. I don't know what you want me to do with this. And they said, well, the vets won't treat it because it's wildlife. And we didn't know of a wildlife rehab nearby. Um, I'll, I'll hint at my age. This was in the 70s and before the Internet was invented. Okay. So um, we had these big buildings called libraries that had books in them. I've heard and of those. So, yeah, I went to the library. And I got a book on bird anatomy and a book on first aid. And I'd done a little bit of vet assisting. So I kind of had a clue what was going on. Luckily, the break wasn't very bad. So I patched up his little wing. And he spent a couple of weeks in a cage in my bedroom. And then pretty soon he was flying around my bedroom. And then pretty soon he was flying around the house. And my mother was quite tired of bird poop on the kitchen counters and said, get rid of it. <laughs> um, and I opened the back door and I literally watched it fly off into the sunset. And I thought, wow, that was really cool. I want to do that again. And, and had, that was in the 70s, though, right? Wow. Okay. Late 70s. Um, and I had absolutely no idea that that would lead me into a life of sleepless nights, running around all places, all hours, up to my waist in muck, trying to grab an injured pelican out of a swamp. Um, yeah. No clue. <laughs> <laughs> so... From that first experience with the Mockingjay, uh, how, how did you progress into doing what you're doing now? Through a very circuitous route. Um, I went from there to, um, oh gosh, uh, like I said, my resume, if I put it all together, if I put in all the pages, it's five pages long. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked as a detention deputy, as I mentioned, in a jail in Colorado. I processed geological samples. I spent several years in the wine country in California doing quality control for a major winery. Um, I moved back to Pennsylvania with my then husband and uh, worked in a veterinary hospital for years. When I landed in back in San Diego, I sold real estate because that's what my mom did. So I helped her out with that. Okay. Um, which was very lucrative, but very personally unsatisfying. And uh, as I said, I met a guy that was from Klamath Falls, but living in Southern California at the time. And we moved back up here and we bought a piece of property intentionally. Uh, that's about an acre and a half. And then we bought the acre and a half behind us as well. So it's just shy of three acres. Mm -hmm. And I intended to rehab maybe half a dozen animals a year just to kind of keep involved with helping wildlife. Um, there were two rehabbers in the basin already. So I figured they had it pretty well covered. I would just kind of fill in the gaps. So in, I want to say that was 2005, I filled out my paperwork for my state licenses, my federal licenses, the not-for-profit status. And before the ink was even dry, I got a call from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and they said, can you take a red tail with a broken wing? And I said, no, I can't. I have no enclosures. I have no permits. I have nothing. And they said, well, that's too bad. We kind of need you right now. Nobody else is available. So we're bringing it to you. Oh, my and gosh. It's been playing catch up ever since. Um, now we have a fully functional facility with a rehab side, the private side where I live. We have a public side where our educational animal ambassadors live, non-releasable animals that we use for education. 
Uh, we have an autoclave, a surgery setup. We have an x-ray machine. We have metal scanners. We have freezer buildings. We have insulated buildings. We have um, an amazing array of stuff to help wildlife that was nowhere near in my vision 15 years ago. So whenever you first started and had that original three acres, what did your facilities look like? Obviously you didn't feel comfortable taking in a, a red tail hawk. What, what was the setup and what were you comfortable taking? what did you start off with? Well, we started off with a red tail hawk and it literally lived in my guest bedroom. I do not recommend that. <laughs> um, hawks do something called slicing where they shoot their poop about six feet because they don't want to soil the area around their nest because that would attract predators. Uh huh. I plastic coated all the walls. It wasn't enough. Um, I can oh. say kills paint lies when they say one coat covers everything. It does not. <laughs> um, I think we're six coats in on that room. And if you look at it in just the right light, you can still see the green stripes down the wall. Oh, mercy. Did you know that before you took that hawk in? Like, yeah. did you know that was not nice? <laughs> learning experience. I, I don't really have any formal training in wildlife rehab. Uh -huh. um, I did work at the wild animal park in San Diego for many years, but not caring for wildlife. I worked in administrative positions. I ran the camping program, um, in night management, that kind of stuff. But I was around these people and involved in these people and gleaned as much information as I could. Mm -hmm. And a lot of online study then later on and, and just a lot of hands on, Hey, I don't know how to fix this. Let's email some people and see what they say. And is that how you rehab that first hawk? I mean, was it a successful rehab? It was. Um, luckily, again, that was a pretty simple break, uh, like my mockingbird. So it wasn't a big deal. Um, since then, we've had some pretty weird, you know, I've had uh, well, one of the most recent ones that was just such a, a heartbreak was a raven that probably had been attacked by a coyote. Mm -hmm. I think they were probably both feeding on a carcass and the coyote went after the raven and broke both its legs at the knees. Oh, no. And so obviously I had to euthanize that, but you don't expect to get a bird in with two broken knee, you know, legs dangling from two broken knees. It just, you know, um, unfortunately, we see a lot of lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. It's still legal to use lead ammunition in Oregon for upland game. Um, we're trying to get that banned. Uh, California is way ahead of us on that. They've banned lead ammunition for la many, many years. Mm -hmm. I know Colorado's working on it. Um, lead fishing tackle, same thing. Yeah. It's, it's a huge problem in the environment. A piece of lead the size of a grain of rice can kill an eagle. That's small. And, yeah. And what we found is um, even a good shot, let's say you're out deer hunting. And mm -hmm. I mind you, I have nothing against legal hunting at all. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're out deer hunting and you're a good shot and you get a good clean harp shot on that deer and it just barely hits a rib a little bit. When you gut that deer, there's lead fragment in the gut pile you leave behind. If you bury it, we're good to go. If you get lazy or out of time or careless and leave it on the ground, the scavengers are going to eat it and ingest that lead. Then you take the deer back to your local butcher and they process it for you and you bring home these lovely little white packages of backstrap and stew meat and whatever you're going to feed your family. Mm -hmm. There was another rehab that x-rayed those lovely little white packages and found lead fragments in almost all of them. So we're ingesting lead whenever we take our meat to have it processed. Yep. Yep. Oh. So um, there's a, an organization we work with here in Oregon that's working with the San Diego Zoo and several other organizations, the Portland Zoo trying to get this information out there, trying to get the government to subsidize lowering the cost of non-lead ammunition and, you know, offering swap out programs and that kind of thing, you know, to, to help with that. My first thought went to um, lead fishing jigs. You know, if you catch a fish and maybe break one off and yep. then the eagle happens to come down and swoop up that fish. Uh, yep. I don't know. I don't know if where you're at is coastal or not. No, we're inland, but that happens a lot. Uh, eagles and osprey ingesting fish that have ingested lead weights and things. Um, we see that. We see 
um, here where the, the farmers grow uh, hay, alfalfa, that kind of stuff, they flood the fields in the winter usually. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't freeze, the geese and ducks will come along and they'll dabble and eat those little roots. Well, it's legal to use lead scatter shot to get the starlings or blackbirds or whatever off your field when they're growing. Mm -hmm. And so all that lead shot is laying there in the ground under this couple inches of water with all these roots. So as these ducks are going through dabbling and eating all these roots, they're ingesting all this lead shot that's laying there as well. And I assume the same amount of lead for a duck or a goose is lethal, same as an eagle, right? Sure. Sure. And then the eagle comes along and eats the dead duck because it's a free meal. It's not going to fight back. It's dead. Mm -hmm. And then the eagle ingests that lead. And now you have a secondary effect. Well, I've been watching a lot of the videos you guys post, which by the way, if anyone wants to see some really cool videos, I got to tell you, you've got some of the best. Uh, watching the eagles and stuff is just amazing. But we, we have fun with that. You'll see some new ones coming up soon that are going to be a lot of fun too. But, you know, in those videos, you see a lot of the, uh, you know, like the limbs being broken, uh, more, I guess, physical contact damage. Is that more prevalent than the lead stuff? It's a combination of both. Um, if you're looking at scavengers, so eagles, vultures, a lot of the hawks, almost all of them test positive for lead. If you're looking at things that are more live prey oriented, like owls and falcons, we don't see as much lead issue in them. Usually that's physical contact with a vehicle. Um, unfortunately, we do see birds that have actually been shot. Um, and that's illegal too. Oh, I mean, very illegal. Um, years ago, I had a guy bring me in a red tail hawk and it clearly had a broken wing. And when I x-rayed it, I could see the lead fragmentation around the break. Cause mm -hmm. obviously when a lead bullet hits a bone, it's going to fragment. Right. So I knew this bird had been shot. Well, when I looked at the actual bullet wound, it went in one wing across the chest and out the other wing. So the only way that can happen is if the bird is perched and sitting with its wings tucked up, that's the only way you can get a clear through and through shot between both wings and the chest. So this bird had to be perched. So I start pushing this guy for a little information because he's looking a little squirrely to me. And he finally admits that he shot the bird. And I said, why? And he said, well, it was an accident. And I said, how did you shoot this bird on accident? And he said, well, I was out duck hunting and I thought it was a duck. Perched in a tree. Perched in a tree with a hooked beak and he's duck hunting with a rifle, not a shotgun. Is that legal in Oregon? I, it's probably legal, but it's probably stupid. Yeah, not the most uh, efficient way to shoot a duck, I assume. I wouldn't think so. So, you know, we have that. We have the kids that uh, they haven't been taught any better and they get a new gun for Christmas and they go out and start shooting things just because they can. Um, pelicans don't do anybody any harm at all. And a couple of years ago, we had somebody not two miles from my house down on the river shooting pelicans just for sport. I picked up six dead pelicans out of the river. I don't think of pelicans as an Oregon animal. Uh, for some reason, I think of them as a, an ocean, like a coastal breed but they they come that far north oh yeah yeah we have them here um they migrate out of here usually in the winter mm -hmm. but they nest inland usually so they'll be on the ocean they'll be on the lakes but they do a lot of their nesting more inland wow okay so back to that very first you got your red tail hawk uh what other animals kind of set the stage for moving forward obviously that first red tail hawk was a big one because that got thrust on you and you had to adapt and move forward. What was kind of next? Um, mostly raptors is what we get. Raptors hit by car is number one. Mm -hmm. um, but we do also get some mammals. Uh, shortly after that, a couple years later, we got into baby badger. Not that badger run was named for that. We were named long before that. Yeah. Excuse me. But we got into baby badger that some hunters had been out shooting uh, what they call sage rats here. In other words, pack rats. Sure. And they saw this badger and they shot it and then realized it was a lactating female. And here came the baby. And I don't know what the difference is, but they felt badly now that they'd killed the mom. And here was this baby. Uh -huh. So they gave it to the rancher who was feeding it cow milk. 
And cow milk isn't really good for anything except cows. Definitely not for baby badgers. Right. So this little guy was pretty sick by the time I got him. Um, but his eyes were open and he knew he was a badger. Um, he was probably about five weeks old. And so I bottle raised him, had no enclosure with a concrete floor. So he lived in my guest bathroom. And badgers have to have a digging box when they're growing because they have to learn to dig while all their neurological connections are forming. Otherwise, they never learn to do it properly. Uh -huh. It's actually a really cool synchronized movement between the front feet that dig and the back feet that then excavate the dirt out of the hole. And if they don't learn it young, they never learn it. So he had a big box of dirt in my bathroom. And he learned very quickly that you could tear up linoleum and big sheets. And that was fun. He learned that drywall was edible. <laughs> and uh, the final straw was that the aluminum water supply line to the toilet, he was able to chew through and flood the place. Yeah. I don't know a whole lot about badgers, but I know that they're incredibly intelligent and incredibly cantankerous. He was one of the most fun creatures I have ever rehabbed in 16 years now. Um, we would go on hikes. I have had several, I've always had several dogs and where I live, I can hike right out my property up a mountain and I'd hike the dogs up there and he'd just run along with us. And if he, we went past the chicken coop, he'd run into the chicken coop and grab an egg and then run out and run ahead of me a couple feet and bury it before I could catch up to him. And then he'd walk off like, no, I don't have an egg. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know. Just like a toddler. Oh my gosh. He was so funny. Um, now an animal like that, that you get that young, does something like that imprint on you? They can, if the eyes are closed, if his eyes had been closed, I probably would have chosen to have him neutered and intentionally raised him as an ambassador, mm -hmm. you know, an education animal because he didn't have anybody to teach him how to be a badger, but his eyes were open. He knew he was a badger. He'd seen his mom. So I raised him as hands off as I could as he got older. We didn't do a lot of cuddling. We didn't watch TV together, you know, that kind of stuff. I did as much interaction as I had to do for his uh, formative development and his education, but nothing cuddly. And uh, he hit about four or five months old and the hormones started kicking in. Uh -huh. And then pretty soon he didn't like anybody except me. And then I would have to even put on two pairs of Levi's and riding boots because when I walked in his enclosure, the first thing he'd do is grab my pant leg and try and throw me to the ground. And by now he was getting to be 35, 40 pounds and all muscle. So um, I had some very brave friends who were rehabbers who agreed to help me test him. And I didn't feed him for a couple of days. And then I had them approach him with some chicken because I wanted to see if he would approach a person for food. And he took one look at them and growled and snuffled and dug a scrape and backed up and wanted nothing to do with them at all. So I was pretty secure that he was going to be a good wild badger. And I released him back into an area um, near where he came from, but where I knew some people lived that would kind of keep an eye on him. And they have zero mice and squirrels on their property. <laughs> and they have seen a lot of badger track in the winter. And then um, a couple of years ago, they had a mom with baby badgers. Well, so, so that was a pretty successful uh, release then. Yeah. I still miss him. It was just a kick. <laughs> um, I have pictures of him just funnier than anything, playing with toys it was kind of a cross between a puppy and a kitten. <laughs> a lot of fun to raise. But yeah, when those hormones kicked in, it was not so fun anymore. It was 40 pounds of teeth and muscle. It's interesting because, well, a couple things are interesting to me. One, you said you didn't have any formal education in, you know, animal rehabilitation or whatever it may be. Um, did you just, once you got an animal, you just started oh, hitting the books and researching? Or did you have other people you could call on? I, both. Um, and my degree is in animal behavior, ecology, and evolution. So when I say I had no formal training, I didn't have any formal training in rehab, but I had a lot of formal training in animal behavior. Okay. And um, that's how I made my living for many years, actually, as an animal behaviorist, working with 
obviously dogs, since that's one of the common ones, but also cats that we're spraying or fighting. Now I've pre I've sort of semi-retired from that, and I pretty much only work with needy exotics because there's nobody else in this area doing it. Mm -hmm. So I take in abused parrots. Um, we have a corn snake that was left in a motel room after being teased and abused. Uh, we have a sulcata tortoise that... Um, you can see on our website that was improperly raised and has severe deformities to her shell. So one of the most interesting ones to me was the, uh, the someone brought you a raven. Yeah. That they tried to raise as a pet. Uh huh. And apparently that doesn't work out so well. No, ravens are so intelligent. In fact, there's a wonderful, I think it's PBS or Nature. There's a wonderful special where they studied some ravens. And it was a university that had a local population and one person would walk out with one mask on and it didn't matter what it was. Let's say it was Bozo the clown mm -hmm. and that person would feed the Ravens and give them treats and leave food out for them and put out bowls of water and, you know, be sweet and kind and that kind of thing. Then somebody else would put on a Gerald Ford mask and walk out and spray them with water and make loud noises and shoot air horns off at them and just be really mean to them. Mm -hmm. Not hurt them physically, but just deter Correct. them. And what they found out was not only did these ravens recognize the mask, no matter what person wore it, they taught their offspring to recognize it. So the offspring knew the minute that mask walked out, whether it was the friendly person or not, even if they'd never seen it before. So that's the intelligence you're dealing with with a raven. What well, um, is the person to even try to get an animal like that? I mean, just un, uh, disinformation or they just they don't know ignorance? I, I have to say, as much as I love them growing up as a kid, Disney movies have done irreparable harm to our wildlife. Um, movies like Dr. Doolittle and you know all the generations of that that give people the, and it, it actually happens. People have actually come up to me and said, well, you don't have to worry about it attacking you. It knows you're here to help it. It won't hurt you. It's an injured wild animal. It will kill me if it can, you know? One of the worst injuries, well, that's not true anymore. I had a worse one, but a bad injury that I had was a barn owl that had fallen from the roof of a potato shed, which, it's about a 40 foot fall to concrete mm -hmm. and it was obviously injured. It was a baby and it was obviously injured. And the guy called me and for various reasons, we couldn't get together for a couple of hours till I could get the bird. And in the meantime, not knowing any better, he had it in the back in a cardboard box in the back of a black pickup truck in an asphalt parking lot in August. Oh no. Yeah. So when we finally got together, I opened this box and this wave of heat just came out of this box and there's a dead owl in the bottom. And I said, buddy, you cooked this owl. And he said, oh my gosh, that was so stupid. I didn't even think about it. I feel so badly. He said, would you at least look at it and tell me it had really bad injuries and it isn't entirely my fault? And I said, sure. So I reached in barehanded because this owl was obviously dead in the bottom of this box. It had to be 200 degrees in this box. It had to be dead. And I reached in barehanded and that owl, as it felt my hand touch him, he opened one eye, sunk all eight talons into my hand and then died. And that was like his last act of defiance of no, you'll never take me alive. You know? <laughs> my gosh. So when people say it won't hurt you, it knows you're trying to help it. That's a movie sentiment. That's not true in the wild world. Of any animal that I know of. No. Uh, in places like SeaWorld that, you know, train the, the killer whales and the dolphins. Okay. Uh, same thing. It, it's given people this false sense of what an animal actually is. And uh, have you ever seen the, the documentary Blackfish? Oh, Yeah. Uh, that really changed my perspective on places like that, even to an extent zoos. Oh, me too. Uh, I didn't realize what happened to an animal like an orca whenever it was placed in captivity. Right. I grew up at SeaWorld. I loved that place as a kid because I didn't know any better. I wanted to be a SeaWorld trainer. You know, I didn't know any better. <laughs> 
Is it the same deal with the uh, you know the raptors or some of the other various animals that come into your place? Does it like you? Let's take for example your ambassador animals. Does it have a negative impact on them to not be quote unquote out in the wild anymore? So this is where we have the hard choices to make. Not every non-releasable animal becomes an ambassador. Um, they have to have the right temperament. They have to adapt to captivity. They have to be what I would interpret as happy, comfortable, pain-free, eager to eat in captivity, that kind of thing. So if we are evaluating something for an ambassador status, and it's jumpy. It's um, I'm sorry. That came out of nowhere. I don't know what that was. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, just a little funky but, interlude there. <laughs> yeah. If, if we, well, it goes with the jumpy part, right? You know, if that's the way they see their environment, um, then we euthanize. Um, because it's just not fair to keep something as an ambassador just because I think it's cool if it's going to be unhappy, uncomfortable, that kind of thing. Right. Um, so what we have as ambassadors are animals that have adapted really well. Um, a really good example is our great horned owl Ewok mm -hmm. came to us as a fledgling and he'd been electrocuted. His parents had made a nest on top of a power pole that had a faulty insulator. And the woman that found him was going out for a horseback ride and she saw mom owl and dad owl, a little baby owl. And she thought that was really cool. And when she came back from her ride, baby owl was by himself and mom and dad were gone. And she thought, well, that can't be okay. So she scooped him up and she called me and we met about halfway. And I couldn't really find anything wrong with it in the first initially. And I said, well, was a road around? Did he get hit by car? She said, no. I said, was there a farmer ranch around? Maybe rat poison, right? That's another one we see a lot of. Mm -hmm. No. And I said, well, you know, and I went through a couple of things. Finally, she got a little irritated and she said, nothing was around. He was just sitting at the bottom of that power pole. Ah, power pole. That was the important word I needed. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, when you get an electrocution like that, it usually takes a day or two to actually start showing. It doesn't always show right away. It can be subdermal. And luckily, if you're going to be lucky when you get electrocuted, it went in his left wing and out his left foot. So it didn't cross his body and cook all his internal organs. Okay. And he was just a fledgling. He was very young. So we decided he would probably adapt okay. We had to amputate the tip, very tip of his wing, just about not quite an inch even of bone and muscle. And so he gets around fine. He's perfectly healthy. Um, Gosh, I'd have to look at my data, but I think he's 16 now. We've had him almost since the very beginning. Wow. And um, in the beginning, he loved everybody. Everybody could handle him. It was just great. And then when he hit six, sexual maturity, when he turned about six, he chose me as his mate. So he calls to me. I call back. I'm the only one that can handle him, but I can handle him. I mean, it's like we're buddies. I don't. I always wear a glove because if he got startled, that's 500 pounds per square inch on needle sharp talons. But that much? yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Our owls are about 500 pounds per square inch and they are needle sharp little daggers. Eagles run, depending on what you read anywhere from about 800 to 1500 pounds per square inch. So I it's had, definite major force. I had no idea. That's incredible. Yeah. It's hand breaking. <laughs> wow. But he's so bonded to me that I can pet him. Um, owls pair bond by mutual preening. So if he seems agitated or nervous at a presentation, maybe there's a fluorescent light giving off a sound he doesn't like. I can preen his feathers and calm him down because that shows him that I'm calm, I'm okay, he can be okay. But what that means is nobody else can go in his enclosure now because if you're a male and you step in, you're a rival male and he's got to drive you out of, the, of his territory. If you're a female, he will drive you away because he doesn't want me to get jealous that he's consorting with other women. So um, that's an example of an ambassador that is very well adapted. He's perfectly happy. We spend a ton of time together. Mm -hmm. He vocalizes all the time. He eats great. He loves, you know, when you walk in with a glove, he jumps right up on it. There's no hesitation. 
You know, so that shows me that he's adapted well to captivity. As long as it's you. As long as it's me. Yeah. Um, our vulture only loves our president, Laura. Uh huh. Um, Dudley, our other great horned owl, will pretty much like anybody as long as you're paying him attention. Same with Paddington, our barred owl. If you are scratching his head, you are his best friend. <laughs> so those ambassador animals, do you still give them any kind of natural activity? Like, do you let them hunt and do other things like that? Yes and no. Um, we have tried some live animal enrichment for them periodically. Part of the problem with that is, and it's a necessary evil when you live in the wild, but when you're attacking a live animal for food, it's going to fight back. Now, if it's a mouse, big deal. You're going to get your toe bit. Mm -hmm. But if it's a jackrabbit and you get kicked in the head, you could lose an eye. You could get a concussion. You could end up with some serious injuries. Um, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, so to speak, doesn't always go so well. So there's that issue to consider. And then all live food typically carries internal parasites. So if, say, Ewok catches and kills a gopher and eats it, and that gopher has internal parasites. Now, Ewok has internal parasites. Now, I come along, and I play with him, and I mess with him. And then I come along, and I say, hi, Zach. Nice to meet you. And I shake your hand. Now you've got it. So pretty much everything we feed is pre-killed, frozen for a few days to get rid of some of that, most of that intestinal bacteria, and then th thawed and fed warm. Okay. So in that regard, no, but we do offer enrichment, believe it or not. Um, they'll play with tennis balls. We have a red tailed hawk that loves tennis balls. You throw a tennis ball in it, she'll chase it and attack it like it was a mouse or a gopher. Huh. Um, we've tried those little like cat toys that are the little motorized squirrel ball kind of thing. Um, our vulture loves a ball pit. We have a big pan with the colored plastic balls in it. We hide his food in it. He loves going through his ball pit, finding his food. Please tell me there are videos of all these things on your Facebook page. There will be. There will okay. be. We're working on it. We don't have it all yet. <laughs> um, but uh, we have a llama that is our guard llama. She keeps the coyotes and other predators away. And she gets sheared every year. So we save her hair. And then instead of just getting a chunk of venison, you might get a chunk of venison wrapped in llama hair inside a paper bag. So you actually have to forage and get open the paper bag get through the llama hair and find your food in the middle. Oh, okay. So we do a lot of different enrichment activities, not exactly like what it would be in the wild. Cause frankly, growing up in the wild is pretty dangerous. Sure. So we, we come up with enrichment things that are fun, entertaining, but a whole lot safer for the ambassadors. Yeah. So we put a lot of time into training them. I'd really hate to have, you know, hours and hours and hours, hundreds of hours put into training an ambassador to be comfortable with a hundred kindergartners or riding in a vehicle or doing a presentation at the airport where you get jets flying over and have it get kicked in the head by a rabbit and have to put it down. Yeah. So you do um, little seminars and things there at the, the facility? Like people we, come and walk? Well, Pre-COVID, we did uh, 275 presentations the year before. Oh, wow. So that makes me think if we're gonna, I want to delve back in the pop culture a little bit. Uh, have you watched uh, Tiger King? Yeah. Okay. I had to. <laughs> Everybody did. It, it was an icon. <laughs> I mean, the guy had a limo waiting outside the prison, thinking he was going to get pardoned. But what, whatever. How does something like that, these exotic animals, tigers, you know, these big mammals, is that a whole lot different than? say some of the exotics that you get like with turtles or eagles or things like that obviously the there are two different spectrums you're not keeping them and breeding them for show to make money off of but the, i guess you could potentially draw a parallel there they're still exotic animals do they need to be there so there's kind of two divisions to that the wildlife that we have as ambassadors is native oregon wildlife that through no fault of their own have become unable to be released into the wild again. And so, as I said before, if they're suitable for a captive environment, we're giving them a lovely retirement home. Nobody's living in a little cage. Um, right. Their enclosures are typically, you know, 10 by 20 feet long. Our eagles live in a 
uh, what is that? 1600 square foot aviary. We have a 1200 foot flight pen or 120 foot flight pen, you know, so nobody's living in little cages. Everybody has plenty of room to hop around, move around. They get taken out all the time. No, we're not breeding them. No, we're not selling them for profit. That kind of thing. Right. On the other side of the spectrum, my other hat is I run a company called Animal Answers, and that's the animal behavior and exotic rescue that mm -hmm. I do for profit. That's kind of how I make my living. Sure. Um, and one of my goals there is to get the big exotic birds out of the pet trade because sort of in a parallel to the tigers, they really don't belong for most people. Most people think it's really cool. Remember the old TV show, Beretta, the detective show, he had that big cockatoo that would sit on his shoulder and everybody thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And everybody wanted to buy cockatoos. So everybody's importing cockatoos and breeding cockatoos. Well, what they didn't tell you years later was of course, you only saw the intakes. You didn't see the outtakes. Mm -hmm. The guy that played Beretta, hated that bird because it bit the crap out of him all the time. <laughs> it yelled all the time. Um, and it had a professional trainer 24 seven. So, you know, the, the people, and again, the Disney movies, the Pollyanna, the parrot and Dr. Doolittle, you know, all you're seeing is the good stuff. You're not seeing where this two pound parrot decimated your mahogany dining table in 20 minutes. Um, is that powerful with their jaws, I assume? Like, oh, these guys are built to tear up wood. One of the first cockatoos I ever dealt with was a Moluccan cockatoo, which is one of the biggest. It's a big pink bird. Uh -huh. It's about like a football with a head and a tail on it. <laughs> and these people called us and said, you will take this bird immediately or we will kill it. And in about 15 minutes, it had gotten out of its cage opened the doors. They're very good at opening latches unless you padlock it. Um, and then even if you leave the key in the padlock, they'll figure out how to turn the key and open the padlock after watching you do it a couple times. This bird got out and ate the leg off a of Steinway Grand Piano, causing it to crash to the floor and splinter into pieces. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, almost every... Let's see if this will come out. Let's see. This, let's see if I can get this up here. That is the tray on my desk after the two minutes I left the bird here while I went to go to the bathroom. Oh my gosh. And that was a small cockatoo. So yeah. Um, and most people are prepared for that. And then the fact that these guys live 40, 50, 60, 80 years, um, their diet is extremely complex. They don't eat seed like everybody thought a hundred years ago. Uh -huh. They have very specific diet needs and they have the emotional maturity of a three-year-old. So imagine taking a three-year-old and locking it in a playpen for 10 hours a day while you go to work and expecting it to grow up to be a good kid. Oh, it's going to be incredibly destructive when it gets out. Mm -hmm. Whoa. So, so wanna... we use some exotics in our presentations like our sulcata tortoise that you've seen on Facebook. Huh. I use some of my parrots, the corn snake that was abused. Um, and we use these, especially when we're talking to the younger groups about being responsible pet owners. Just because you can order it online, whether it's a parrot or a tiger cub, doesn't mean it's going to be a good pet. Um, and we're really trying to get that word out there for people to be smart and educate themselves before they get it. And the same so, can be said for someone buying a puppy too, you know, oh yeah. uh, someone that buys a, a dog that needs a lot of activity out outdoor activity, running, walking, and they buy it for a small apartment. Exactly. Uh, and it, it tears up their furniture. And next thing you know, there's a, a puppy at the pound or, or whatever. Yep. So when yep. you first started, did you have this vision of kind of um, uh, animal rights or, you know, educating people about how to properly and safely interact with nature or was it all about rehab at first? Um, the original was probably when I was at the pet shop 
and in my late teens, early 20s, and people would bring in these big birds and say, you know, will you buy this from me? Can I put it on consignment? Well, how long have you had it? 20 years. Why are you getting rid of it? Oh, it's just too messy now. You know, and it, that'd be like saying you're going to get rid of your wife just because you don't like her new perfume or, you know, whatever. I mean, I thought about that. Have a bond with something for years and years and years and then say, never mind, I don't want you anymore. Um, and I ended up doing rescue of all these guys. I ended up with 27 pets in a one bedroom, no pet apartment. And that's when I said, OK, wait a minute. I'm not doing them any good this way either. Nobody's getting enough time. Nobody's got enough space. Their enclosures are too small. I need to be smart about how to do this. I can't just take them all and save the world. Right. So that's always been my mission. Even when I was rarely working in non-animal related jobs because they pay better. I mean, let's mm -hmm. face it, unless you're a veterinarian, most animal related jobs pay squat. Um, so I would work, for example, as a detention deputy or head of quality control at a winery so I can make enough money to support rescuing some of these animals. Okay. So evolved from there. Uh, your, your original plot you said was approximately what, three acres. Like you bought the acre and a half. Um, how long did it take you to grow them back up? How big is the, the property now? That's how big it is. It's we're still that big. Everything. Yep. We're, we, I don't have any place to go. Um, I would love 20 or 30 acres. I'm horribly envious of a rehab in Northern Oregon that just purchased a huge piece of property with a wetland and a pond and all kinds of stuff. And I'm green with envy over that, but, um, you know, we're not in a very affluent area here. We have a ton of really diligent supporters that have gotten us through COVID, um, because we can't do tours right now. We sure. can't do presentations. And that's a huge part of our fundraising. So um, a lot of rehabs have really been struggling, like a lot of other businesses, restaurants and everything else. Right. Um, but we have some really sturdy supporters that have kept us going um, and, and done their part in making sure that we've still got food for the critters and the power still turned on and that kind of stuff. And but, it seemed like your supporters really in the beginning uh, were donating. Uh, I, I was looking through some of the history you know, donating some of the buildings and some of the enclosures that you needed to kind of get things started. And you just built up from that. Yeah. And, you know, in the beginning, had I had this dream that we were going to have a public side and a rehab side and a big flight pen and all, there would have been this great plant. My father was an engineer. I'd have had this all drawn out on graph paper with blueprints and everything, but that was never the plan. It just kept growing and growing. Um, the two rehabbers that were in the basin when I started, one has passed away, one is retired. Um, they closed the rehabs closest to us down in California, uh, Mount Shasta, Redding, those closed. There was one in Bend that closed and it has since opened up under new management, but we cover a huge area. So we just ended up, you know, and I won't say no. I'm not going to say, no, I can't take that sparrow. It's going to have to live in my bathroom. I don't have another cage. I'll find some place to put it. <laughs> How many birds are in your house right now? I heard, I've heard some chirping and stuff. In the house right now, I have two rescued African gray parrots that I'm retraining. Both were mishandled. Uh -huh. So um, they were tame as babies, but they are no longer tame. So I'm retraining them. And then I have two parakeets, a collared dove, Six finches, the tortoise, a partridge in a pear tree, four dogs, two cats, and had a pelican in the bathtub this evening because that was the only place I had big enough for it to have a bath. Oh my gosh. I've got an aunt that is just like you. She, uh, she's an animal lover and her house is just covered in animals. But uh, I want to take a minute to talk about the eagle you've been uh, rehabbing. Uh, yep. he's got a number. I don't know if he has a name yet. So bald eagle, 2020, 184. Uh -huh. Um, we don't typically name animals in rehab because that tends to make us more familiar with them and make us want to talk to them and cuddle them and call them, but you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, in this case, however, 
there is nothing cuddly about this bird at all. She wants to kill us. So um, the people over at Garrett Metal Detectors donated two metal detectors to us, a static and a, I forget what they call it, but the kind you see in the airport where they're checking your pant legs and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, they were intrigued with Eleanor's story because of her lead poisoning. Or, I'm sorry, 184's story because of her lead poisoning. And so they donated these metal detectors to us because it ought, it's an easier way to check for lead fragments than mm -hmm. taking x-rays. And if it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm here by myself and I don't have anybody to help me take an x-ray, I can't do that solo on a bird like this. But a metal detector, I can. I can run that over and see, you know, what if I've got metal fragments in there. Um, and they started calling her Eleanor because that is the name of the wife of the guy that started Garrett Metal Detectors. Okay. And they said, is that okay? I said, you can call her anything you want. Well, it's kind of stuck. So we sort of refer to her as Eleanor around here. <laughs> so uh, you, you got this eagle. And the, the most recent thing I've seen is you've been working with its talon, right? So this bird was hit by car. Uh -huh. um, the, the guy that hit the bird is a local co fencing contractor. And, um, one of the guys on it, he, he quoted fencing for us. So he knew who we were. So he contacted us and it was going to be about an hour before I could get out there to him. He stayed with the bird and made sure she was off to the side of the road and okay. Um, and when I got there, it was real clear what had happened. We have, um, fairly deep ditches alongside of some of our roads for runoff and snow and that kind of stuff. And there was a dead deer down in this ditch. And this eagle had been down in the ditch eating the deer. So she was below line of sight from the road. Right. Well, then she heard his pickup truck coming. Had she just stayed there, she'd have been just fine. But she heard the vehicle and flew up out of the ditch to escape the vehicle and ended up right about license plate height as he came by. But there was no way he could have seen her coming. Um, so he stopped. He stayed with her till I got there. And this bird was obviously deficit on the left side. It wasn't working as well as the right side, mm -hmm. but she was working well enough that normally I can, I have a big quilt and big leather gloves and I can corner it kind of in a fence and throw the quilt over and scoop it up and drop it into a carrier. This bird is the first bird in all the years I've been doing this that actually ran at me and tried to attack me. Oh, shoot. And her adrenaline was pumping, so she wasn't feeling any pain at the moment. And I had to get out of her way or she'd have nailed me in the leg. And so we kind of got sort of basically a, a grip on each wing and kind of carried her back that way and got her in the carrier. I took her straight to the veterinarian because I knew we work with a couple of local vets. So I took her to Dr. Marcy Keener over at Eastridge who I knew had trained staff to handle an aggressive bird like this. And I said, I'm not going to try X-raying her at my place. You guys have more people. You guys deal with it. So what they did was they put a tube right in the carrier that I had her in. It's a big Rubbermaid tote with holes in the top. Mm -hmm. So they put a tube in and they anesthetized her in the tote. So no stress, no, no big deal for her. She just went to sleep. Right. Then they took her out and did full X-rays and nothing was broken. But um, we drew blood for a lead test, and she did have definitely measurable lead, which was probably what affected her judgment and had her fly out of a perfectly safe pit on the side of the road into an oncoming vehicle. Mm -hmm. So we treated her for lead, and it became apparent that even though she didn't have any broken bones, she had neurological damage. Um, and the, the left foot was not functioning at all. It was closed. It was dragging. It was like it was completely dead. One of our volunteers is an occupational therapist at the local hospital. So she said, well, here's what we need to do. And that's what you see on Facebook is this progression from, I think it's December 5th. Yep. There's a progression of videos of her physical therapy progress and what we're doing. The latest we've done, she's now out in the flight pen. She's flying beautifully. She's using the left leg but she's not putting equal weight on it to the right leg. 
So we're attaching an ankle weight to her on that left leg to make her more aware of it and build up the strength in that leg. Never done that before. So our first prototype that we came up with, she had off within a day. So we've now revamped and another volunteer who's an excellent seamstress is building a new anklet for her with a different buckle system that will hopefully stay on. And do you expect this eagle to, to make a recovery and get released? I do. Um, it, we're not out of the woods 100% yet, but she's improving all the time. And if this ankle weight does what the occupational therapist thinks it will, then in this case, we will test her on a live rabbit because I need to know she can hunt live prey before I release her. And if she can catch and kill a large live rabbit, she'll be ready to go. Wow. That is amazing. She's, it's, I had to laugh. The latest Facebook post that um, our president put up shows us doing the video of catching her and putting the ankle weight on her. Uh -huh. But it also has a still shot. I, I am, I love cold weather. So I don't typically dress heavy in cold weather. I like to say Colorado, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, you know, it's in my blood. So if it's 30, 40 degrees, I'll be in a, a sweatshirt maybe. Right. Uh huh. I walked into the care center to meet up with the team to go catch this eagle. And I'm in full coveralls, a leather jacket, um, my mask, of course, a hat, a full head hat over that. And the picture's up on Facebook. And my, the president just said, we've got to put that on Facebook. And I said, why? She said, why are you dressed like that? It's not that cold out. I said, it's not about the cold. I'm going to be point person grabbing that eagle. I want all this clothing on. <laughs> How big is this eagle's, eagle's wingspan? Uh, six and a half feet. It's amazing when, I mean, everybody sees an eagle on television or, or whatever. When you see them in person, they are huge. Oh, yeah. she's And she is a monster. Um, she is almost 15 pounds. And 15 pounds might not seem like a lot, but for a bird... Yeah. You know, that flies and, and catches things. That, that's incredible. Yeah. 15 pounds of muscle and talon. <laughs> so. Yeah. Cause the pictures of her talons, they're big. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's why you see me in this full getup. Not because it's cold out. It's only about 30 degrees because if she comes at me, I want that much protection on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many workers do you have or volunteers rather at, at the facility? Um, so I am the only employee I get paid for 20 hours a week. Thanks to a grant from the Kinsman foundation. I work more than that, but that's what I get paid for. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, we have three other volunteers that come feed during the week. Um, one is also our president. One is also our assistant secretary treasurer. And the other one is this occupational therapist that I mentioned. And then we have another handful of volunteers that are trained to do pickup and transport. And they're kind of scattered throughout the area. So if we get a call for something that's two or three hours away, one of us doesn't necessarily have to drive three hours out to go get it, try and find it three hours back. We might have somebody closer by that can at least pick it up and get it in a box. So we aren't on a wild goose chase, literally sometimes. Right. And I assume that uh, you know Badger Run has plans to keep going after the, the president decides to step down or you decide to to stop? What's the future kind of look like? That's a really good question. Do you know anybody who'd like to move to Oregon and run a wildlife facility? There you go. I don't know shit about it, but I'll try. <laughs> hey, it's, it's, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not shy about it. I turned 59 this year. So how many more years am I going to be able to do this or want to do this? Um, my goal is probably within the next five years to step down. Um, and hopefully, I think we're sort of trending towards um, the, the property will all go to Badger Run and whoever is the new wildlife care manager will be able to live in the house for free. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's kind of the perk because the pay sucks, um, you know, but that's kind of the perk is they'll be able to live in the house for free right. and um, manage the, the wildlife. Um, we have some young volunteers that we've kind of held off on right now with COVID because they have, say, a larger family, so it's a higher exposure risk. Sure. And really myself, 
Um, probably myself and the president and maybe one other volunteer are really the only people that could run this place on a daily basis if one of us went down. Right. So we're being a little ultra careful. Um, so volunteers that had large families or are active in whatever situation that they have a higher COVID exposure, we've kind of said, hey, you know, back off for now. We'll see you in the spring. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, hopefully you find someone because I, th I think what you're doing is incredible for one. And it's important because I, I'm a hunter. I, I enjoy hunting, but I don't like seeing animals suffer. Right. So I, I think that's a common theme throughout, you know, people responsible uh, outdoor recreationists. They don't like, they don't like to hurt animals. That's just something that is in us. Right. Uh, so hopefully you can keep doing what you're doing because someone needs to, to help these animals. It's not going to go away. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out one way or another. We've got a couple of volunteers that, you know, sort of have it in the back of their minds that maybe someday um, they're young and have families. And it's, I mean, it's really a great house. It's, you know, a, a two bedroom, two bath house. And then there's a mother-in-law flat attached with it's fully, it's connected, but it's fully self-sufficient with its own driveway and yard. And that's where the tortoise lives right now. Um, and the <laughs> bathroom is where the pelican was. So I still have my bathroom. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's too many people that love it. Um, I, you know, I would stay here walking around with my walker and my cane and before I let it go away. Sure. Um, you know, this has been my baby for 16 years and it's a lot of blood, sweat and tears into it. I'm not going to let it just go away because I want to buy an RV and travel the country, you know. Oh, I'd imagine. So for people that may be listening or watching, um, what's what's a, the best way that they could help Badger run and keep you guys you know, doing the things you do? Um, sharing our message is huge. Um, if you see a post on Facebook that you like that has a message about non-lead hunting or um, bleaching your bird feeders, there's a really simple, stupid one. How many people have bird feeders in their backyard and every morning they fill it up with seed and they walk away and they watch the birds and they think that's cool. Those bird feeders need to be bleached and disinfected often, especially in the winter, because you get such a congregation of birds that anybody that has any viruses or bacteria is starting to spread it to all these other birds now. So in the winter, we start seeing a huge influx of pine siskins and other little sparrows and finches that die from this eye infection. So it sounds like a stupid little trivial thing, but it's important. Um, feeding ducks and geese at the park. That's one of our big messages along with lead. Bread is toxic. Bread is horrible for these guys. In young birds, it causes what's called angel wing or flip wing, which renders them unable to fly. Um, we recently picked up a pelican from the boat docks right here in Klamath Falls that we knew about. It's missing a section of wing. We don't know how that happened. But we went to catch it a couple of times, and it just jumps in the water and swims away. And it's on an area of a river that doesn't freeze, and it's perfectly happy. There's plenty of fish. And so we figured, oh, fine, we'll just leave him there. He's fine. No, we had to go get him because stupid people were feeding him bread and oatmeal and things like that. And he got so sick that one of our volunteers was able to walk right up to him and pick him up. Oh, you know? boy. And now he's here. And we'll probably have to euthanize him. I don't know. Um, he's doing fine now. He's healthy. But, you know, what do you do with a one-winged pelican? Um, Stick him in your bathtub. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. But it's not what everybody does. So, um, so, you know, getting that message out there, sharing those things. Um, the obvious one, of course, is financial support. You know, we, we don't get any state or federal funding. Um, they're very happy to call us and say, can you drive 100 miles and go pick something up? And I say, we don't have the money for the gas. And they say, well, neither do we. We're sorry. Um, you know. Um, I, we are very lucky in that our particular local biologists are very helpful with transporting for us when they have time. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when it's deer season or something like that, they're too busy. Sure. But, you know, when they're available, they're very helpful. And our local Fish and Wildlife Office, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Office, is really helpful. Because um, there's things that we're a bunch of little old ladies here. You know, so you tell me you got an injured bird on a pond and the pond is half frozen. I'm not sending us out in kayaks. It's just too dangerous. Yeah. So 
you know, sometimes we get these state police or, you know, the, the government officials that will, that actually get paid to do this stuff, you know, that will go out and help us out. But when it comes to funding, 95% of our funding, it comes from people like you that say, Hey, have badger run. Here's $5. Here's $25. Here's $250, you know? Um, and nothing is too small. We actually had bumper stickers made up years ago that said, donate a dollar buys a mouse, you know, <laughs> you know, if I've got to buy 500 mice, that's $500. Wow. Now, now we're big enough that we breed our own mice. Right. I've got my a mouse breeding facility going, but you know, quail, I have to buy quail for the Falcons that eat birds. Quail cost us two, two dollars and 50 cents a piece. Sure. And a Falcon will need a quail in two days. So, you know, um, but, you know, wildlife rehab is the one business that you really kind of want to be out of business. So I would love to see people spread that message of non-lead ammunition, non-lead non -lead fishing tackle. Just, you know, on our Facebook page, you'll see tons of different ways that we suggest to be good stewards of the environment. Raise your kids that way. Teach them the right way to take care of wildlife. And like I said, and you said it too, I have nothing against hunting. I've been hunting. I just thought it got really hard to carry that gun after miles and miles at five in the morning and 20 below temperatures, trying not to make frozen leaves crunch. It's like, mm. this is ruining my camping trip. I don't like this. Um, <laughs> I love venison. So, you know, I'm nothing against hunting, but hunt with, with responsibility, uh, fish with responsibility, treat the environment with responsibility. Don't get in your four wheeler and go out there and tear up a meadow in breeding season or any time, but you know, that's what they make sand dune parks for and things like that. Exactly. There are places to do those things. Yes. Uh, and your Facebook page is just Badger Run Wildlife Rehab, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And the website is badgerrun.org. Badger okay. And there they can see uh, the ambassador animals. They can see all your information right there. Yep. Uh, I'll be honest. We're better at updating the Facebook page than we are the website um, because it's easier. But uh, yeah, our ambassadors are all on the Facebook page, along with some success stories we've had, a little bit more about us, who we are, who our board of directors is, that kind of thing. Well, I'll tell you, the, your, you or your Facebook page is probably the most fascinating one on Facebook to me. Uh, I just want to see a, a video of that vulture playing in a ball pit, please. Okay, I'll get that for you, Zach. <laughs> Liz, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, and you've got an open invitation anytime you want to come on and talk about birds. Okay. Well, if I get something in real interesting, I'll let you know. I'd love it. Thanks, okay. Liz. All right. Thanks, Zach. Take care. Bye.